Hello and welcome to Views on News. I'm Jawad Hamid. The United Nations is holding two-day closed-door talks regarding the situation in Afghanistan in the Qatar's capital, Doha. The United Nations Secretary General Office says the meeting is intended to achieve a common understanding within the international community on how to engage with the Taliban on the women and girls' rights, on inclusive governance, uh, on countering terrorism and drug trafficking. Earlier, we saw that the United Nations Secretary General said that the Taliban uh, wouldn't be invited to this particular moot. Now, the Taliban after this responded by saying that any meeting on Afghanistan without the participation of the Afghan Taliban or the Afghan government uh, is ineffective and counterproductive. They had also said that the decision to exclude the representatives of the IEA was discriminatory and was unjustified. Now, representatives of 25 countries and groups are participating in this uh, uh, particular moot. At, uh, this particular moot comes as the UN is expected to review whether it continues to operate uh, in the war damaged Afghanistan or not in the wake of the Afghan Taliban ban on women working in the UN offices. Also, we have seen that the 15 member United Nations Security Council condemned Afghan Taliban's uh, decision of banning uh, the women from their employment in the UN offices and uh, it also urged for an immediate reversal of this particular decision to which we saw the Taliban responded by saying this is an internal social matter of Afghanistan that does not need to be uh, politicized. Now, we also know Pakistan State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ms. Hinarabani Khan, is in Doha to attend this particular uh, moot uh, that is being hosted under the auspices of the United Nations. As per the Foreign Office of Pakistan, she will be presenting Pakistan's perspective vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and uh, building a consensus regarding the way forward with international and regional partners also. Uh, we also know uh, that as per the Foreign Ministry of Afghanistan, the Afghan Foreign Minister, Amir Khan Muttik, is also expected to visit Pakistan uh, during uh, this particular week. On all these issues, uh, to discuss and more, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Dr. Sayyid Kaleem Imam. He's expert in international relations. Uh, Dr. Imam, thank you very much for taking time out for Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. We are also honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Ali Sarwan Nakwi, his former ambassador. Mr. Nakwi, thank you very much for your time also for being with us. Later on in the show, we'll be joined by another participant and I'll be introducing him later there and then. Uh, Dr. Imam, let's uh, begin the discussion with you. How significant do you think this particular mood under the auspices of the United Nations is? There's being chaired, of course, by the United Nations Secretary General, uh, whose office says that it is basically aimed at uh, finding out the ways in order to how to engage with the Taliban regarding four uh, major matters that include the counter-terrorism, counter countering drug trafficking, women and girls' uh, rights, as well as uh, their um, inclusive government over there also. Well, thank you very much for inviting me in your program. Uh, well, again, it is one of those many dozens of meetings which have been held on Afghanistan, and this is yet uh, another in, uh, in uh, all, uh, almost completed, I would say. Today was the second day. What is the purpose of this meeting? That's, that, that would be one, one thing one would like to ponder, you know. Is it like they would like to see that humanitarian assistance is being uh, continues like it is being continued? And uh, they would also like to have one voice on the issue maybe. Uh, they also might like to put some pressure on the regime regarding the women rights and some of the things that you have uh, pointed out over here. But again, if they are not there, what purpose would it serve again? The history is, all, is going to judge that in times. But uh, I believe this, uh, there might be an outcome in the context that people are looking that maybe they will be able to uh, give women some rights. You know, there are almost 39 million Afghanis and, uh, uh, in Afghanistan and with 19 million of them females, you know, you just can't leave them on the side. It's nothing Islamic. And it's uh, nothing to do with Islam, basically. But the Taliban say it's an internal social matter. It shouldn't be politicized. Do you really think that, uh, do you think this uh, particular statement carries any weight? Uh, is this uh, issue being politicized by the international community? I believe that you, you cannot live in isolation. 
you live in a world community it's a give and take they they are uh, convenient uh, to the, uh, the they are members to the uh, signatories to the many covenants which uh, united nations have had like international covenant for political and civil rights child rights women rights they are signatory so all of a sudden if they say well we don't follow it anymore uh, doesn't make much signatory uh, the taliban the afghanistan the afghanistan afghanistan is, is yeah. but they are the de facto government over there they, they are and they have not been they recognized, not internationally recognized but there's a boundary so is there's it a territory incumbent upon them to follow uh, all those uh, principles you know it, it has a, a traditional and historical understanding that a country who is obliged who who has agreed to the international covenant uh, covenants need to accept that they need to live with the international community now a regime comes which is a de facto regime it, it it has its own argument to say why they are not doing it but then the, there are many things they are doing with the other countries like trade uh, like number of other diplomatic things which is happening you know they they have to do lot of import and export they are already down on e uh, on the economy factors you know on the economy side they just can't say that uh, they are island and uh, they can do w with what they please then they need to understand that they have to come some acceptable standards you know if they want in times to be recognized right uh, mr nakwi the taliban as per the statement that has been issued by the foreign ministry they want to engage with the world community at the same time we see them continuously violating uh, whatever the commitments they made to the international community before taking over now um, regarding specifically the women rights now the united nations said that uh, it was forced to make an appalling choice uh, and uh, it can't follow anything which is in contravention in contradiction to the un charter and in principle uh, and principles so do you think it would be uh, difficult for the united nations to operate in the war ravaged afghanistan given the circumstances that the taliban are not ready to acknowledge those rights of women over there yes well <coughs> there are many uh, aspects to this question in the first place i will endorse the point already made that if a country is signatory to certain international conventions or treaties or agreements then the regime that comes which does not accept those uh, conventions or any of those conventions has to renounce it has to dissociate itself from that otherwise it is presumed that they are obligated to follow the terms of that agreement or that convention so the uh, convention on uh, social and uh, human rights that uh, was being referred to by my colleague here uh, uh, is is uh, was signed by the afghan government with whichever government was in uh, power at that time and uh, the taliban are obligated to follow the uh, provisions of that convention secondly afghans the taliban government has raised the point that they that this uh, demand of the united nations is a uh, interference in their internal social uh, norms uh, but the western countries and many international countries abroad or in other uh, areas or regions like japan let alone western countries or south korea or uh, even china uh, they are committed to allow uh, uh, demanding these rights from all countries so the afghan regime is uh, putting itself at odds with the rest of the world effectively and this is an issue that uh, will will uh, uh, force the un to take a decision and this is what the conference is about to decide whether international programs can be uh, continued in afghanistan or not and uh, if they decide not to continue uh, the aid programs the relief for the uh, you know alleviation of poverty alleviate food supplies etc then it will mm, cause a lot of harm to the afghan people let alone the taliban government so the taliban government has to look at it uh, in that perspective 
and you know the point that this is uh, it uh, that i will agree that it is a social norm that they have established but it has nothing to do with islam because because in islam women have the right to work and women have the right uh, to to uh, play their role in society i mean you know uh, our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uh, wife was was a working woman and she she was very prosperous but she had business and therefore she was. so we have a tradition in islam that women will work and uh, the taliban are interpreting it in the wrong way uh, in our view therefore now that uh, minister of state uh, Ms., uh, mrs hena rabani khar is there she will assert the position of the government of pakistan that uh, the uh, afghan uh, regime should follow the norms that are established internationally not insist on their norms uh, so you know there is that uh, uh, difference between the two so why, why 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 do you think the united nations didn't invite the afghan taliban to this particular move because the, uh, the kind the of united statement that states, we have seen the united nations is this is the, the united the, the, nations the united nations the didn't invite the taliban the the kind of statement that we have seen by the taliban that any meeting about afghanistan without the participation of the afghan government is going to be ineffective and uh, this particular uh, thing is unjustified and discriminatory so why were the afghan taliban not invited to this the major stakeholders i think they should have invited the afghan regime however the pa reason perhaps is that the the afghan government has not been recognized by uh, the international community so they don't want to deal with a government which has not been uh, accepted by the rest of the world uh, and uh, there is i think a gray area about who represents the afghans because in the united nations in the uh, membership like for many many years China the people's republic of china was not represented uh, representing china uh, it was the nationalist government in taiwan that was representing china so uh, the un uh, uh, sometimes does take a, uh, a, a very strict interpretation of the uh, uh, the legal position however that legal position is not often not correct because the reality on the ground is different and therefore if they think that Uh, there is no afghan government that's wrong uh, and i think they must uh, establish some modus operandi with the uh, taliban regime in uh, kabul and deal with it and uh, i i think that they they should have invited the taliban regime but the western countries are very powerful and they are the ones who have probably uh, Uh, countered that do, do you uh, uh, dr imam do you think it was actually meant to send us a uh, certain message to the afghan taliban uh, look uh, around 25 countries and groups are participating in this particular moot yet you are being excluded and there was a response by the taliban so there must be some um, uh, implicit meaning in that particular gesture well the simple the simple understanding is we haven't recognized your regime uh, you haven't held any elections uh, you have taken it by force it's again against the earlier doha negotiation that we held so you didn't f uh, follow those things that you agreed and this is one of the major reasons they say we don't recognize you you're not there but like the excellency just said there's a second tier and it's a track to diplomacy which is going on uh, there's one mr suhail shaheen you know he's a rap in doha and he has been going around meeting with this 25 countries which includes uh two unions you know like european union and oic, OIC. so he he has been talking to them and i think he is carrying a message from the non recognized taliban regime you know and he is trying to bridge in and trying to uh, present their arguments so you have a general statement spokesman's view and but there's also deep down they also want settlement you see the afghans you know uh, like what uh, has been just said you know there is some sort of a sanity over there stability over there uh, the security has improved uh, let's uh, uh, if you made me a devil advocate for a while you see things have improved over there you know like they say when a trade enters in afghanistan you just pay at one place and then you can travel all the way to all the borders but have the things improved when it comes to 
uh, women rights it uh, hasn't their I, employment I and their right to education also uh, i didn't say that. that don't you think that's the sticking point the international community wants an immediate reversal of this particular ban one it is un-islamic two if they are saying it is culturally it was there that is also that doesn't substantiate kabul before 1975 there were women who were working there even in uh, earlier just about couple of decades ago there were a lot of universities and students and, and 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 the education system was going on so if they come up with this argument you see there's a debate between hardcore taliban and the the those pragmatic new young lord you know so but they have but they are all taliban in the end so they believe somehow that it is not to be allowed and this 19 million you know Afghanis, you know females not being given opportunity to participate is just not very viable and conducive you know for any country to progress if they really want to move ahead with that you know so what if uh, the united nation decides to discontinue its operations over there so uh, do they realize the gravity of the fallout of this particular decision if the humanitarian assistance doesn't reach to the common afghan people over there uh, you so see on whose shoulder that responsibility would be they didn't do it when the americans were due and i don't think they are going to do it now it's through the th track to or whatever you know most of the trade which is informally taking place you know the food items goes from pakistan and they are about we understand there are about 2.5 million people below the poverty lines which are over on that side i don't think that is their ultimate objective they are, they want one voice they want to pressurize they want them to bring to uh, a platform where they at, at least make them agree uh, to talk about women education you know and on, on a lesser side they would like at least the UN women should be allowed to uh, start working over there you know. they, they will try to there will be a give and take but I think they want one voice they also want to see those 25 countries what they have to say about it bring them on one on on, on one forum so uh, when the United Nations Security Council unanimously the 15 members of it condemned this particular ban so what else is there any change still expected when we uh, talk about the perspective of the Taliban that these 25 countries are going to come up with a different voice I think it's going to make a difference and uh, they will link that with the humanitarian assistance like you just said which they are not going to stop in the end they're also going to link it with some other concessions that they would like to give you see right now few of the neighboring countries and even in times you know maybe after 20 months you would see Afghanistan becoming a favorite baby again you know with, with the resources that they have right now the situation is quite different you know and so even now a lot, lot of foreign corporates and companies have started working over there there's an informal channels going on over there you don't have embassies it's not recognized but there are rep reps are from almost every country over there you know trying to look after their interests you know. so I, th I think they are trying to voice and pressurize the Afghan regime. You know. So if the corporate sector has already started functioning over there and you all, uh, already mentioned there are around 19 million women and if they, uh, you don't let them participate in the uh, functioning of the state and its affairs. So even no matter how much corporate sector comes in and invests in Afghanistan, so if keeping that uh, population aside and not letting it participate in the uh, activity do you think there is going to be um, an economic boom that the Afghan Taliban so much look forward to uh, that's where they are going to chip in and, and try to bargain with Afghanistan you know if, if they, they would try to pressurize them that if you formally want that your funds to be released the the aids and the grants which is st uh, which is right now uh, seized and it's not being provided it's under sanction if you want them to be released they can again bargain that with one of this component you know but on the uh, other side you know deep down there are a lot of things which is happening on the front of it you see there's a ban there's a sanction uh, there's condemnation but down everyone wants to have a share nobody wants a space to be left open Right, uh, Mr. Nagvi, uh, as we saw that the Security Council when unanimously condemned, it also has acknowledged the kind of challenges Afghanistan is basically faced with. And this particular thing has been acknowledged and welcomed by the Afghan authorities over there also. Now, uh, given this particular circumstances, when we talk about uh, Afghan Taliban's position regarding the rights, um, uh, rights of women, if they stick to this particular ban, uh, do you think uh, the United Nations should ideally continue to operate over there? Yes, I think the humanitarian pl program that they have is needed by the people of Afghanistan. You see, in all international uh, dealings, uh, the, the position or the plight of the 
ordinary people is, is uh, ignored. And that is not fair because the United Nations is an organization, the first line of the UN Charter says, we the peoples. It begins in the name of the people, not in the name of the governments. So, the people must not suffer in my view and they, they should continue with these plans. However, all pressure should be exerted on the Afghan Taliban regime that they should uh, allow the women uh, to, to uh, have right to education and uh, right to work. Now, I read an article by the way, Jawad, that uh, there are groups as he said uh, in, within the Taliban, those who support the education of women and the women uh, uh, working uh, uh, of women uh, uh, in, in different jobs, they, uh, they want their daughters to go to school and uh, clandestinely many of them are sending their daughters to uh, these uh, uh, unofficial schools. So, uh, and then uh, they cannot go against the dictum of the, the seniors who are very strongly opposed to women's education. So, I mean there, there are fissures within the, the uh, uh, regime and the system and I think eventually they cannot hold back, you see, they cannot hold back uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the time machine, uh, they, they are in the 21st century, they are not in the 10th century or in the 12th century. So, they, they cannot fight against uh, the uh, time and its requirements, and they have to accept it. That is on the one hand. On the other hand, the, the humanitarian assistance should continue because that will make the people of Afghanistan suffer. So, I, I have these two right, positions. Dr. Imam, is there any possibility that this, this particular mood by, might be deliberating uh, on baby steps towards the recognition of, of the Afghan Taliban as the legitimate government? As we earlier saw, there was a statement by the Deputy uh, Secretary of the United Nations, um, which was, of course, uh, said by the United Nations that it was misinterpreted. She said that uh, uh, this particular mood is going to basically uh, be um, focused on baby steps towards the recognition of the Taliban? Well, ultimately, someday they might recognize. But before that, they need to set the house in order, which means they want their, their takes and uh, uh, what they believe is like uh, some democratic moves and the aspirations of people. And they now believe that they can be an international corporation. You know. They would look into all those aspects before they come to the acceptance and recognition of the Taliban regime. Again, they might go for, let's, why don't you hold elections? Why don't you legitimize yourself? Why don't, why don't your own people say that you are actually the legitimate people of, of this area and you rule accordingly, you know, the, in, if, through the inclusive policies and so maybe again, but I don't think they are, they, with a situation like what you have just said about the women rights and women education and regressive steps that they have taken, you know, that they would write away say, well, take a concession where you are not at all giving, uh, trying to give at, uh, given at all, you know. So, but they are trying to have some track through and all those things. But right now, the hardcore Taliban, you know, they want to live with the way they are living, you know, and they are comfortable with that. So, what needs to be done? What strategy do you think the international community must adopt and implement in order to impress upon them that uh, at least they um, lift this particular ban on employment of women? Spe uh, specifically, when we talk about the UN officers. Okay, l l let's uh, let's look at from another angle. You know, it took even West to years and centuries. You know, before they gave rights to the women, you know, and before the sa slavery ended, and before the women were allowed to vote and we were allowed to work, you know. It, it took them centuries to do that. They must also try to understand that it's difficult for the Afghan leadership, you know. Uh, not that I'm supporting what they're saying. It's the way they understand the world, you know. And so, don't make them digest things that they are not ready to accept, you know. So, you can talk to them, try to mainstream them, try to lure them, uh, talk to them in some way, even if you don't recognize them, make them part of some... Uh, uh, some sort of a negotiation, keep a continuous uh, sort of a talk and uh, make them feel, you know, like even the cricket team, you know, it's playing all over. So, that's also sending a message. But, and there are other things that they're doing, you know, like they brought stability in Afghanistan. 
So my point would be they, they have actually to make them come towards their orbit, make them come towards what they believe are the true aspirations, uh, their people wanting what they believe that they are they're wanting, but they seem to be following Taliban for a while. But of course, uh, with their modernization, with their progressive steps, and with uh, the new technologies which is coming, you see, they still have internet. I mean, I was just going through almost 20 percent, you know, people are still operating internet, you know, it's weak and add some, ne but people are able to access. And I was watching one uh, uh, documentary from Al Jazeera, which was saying that many girls are still learning English through the, those net, you know. So, but slowly and gradually, you know, as these Taliban would come home, I'm sure there's going to be a women pressure. 19 million is quite a, no quite a number. Right, Mr. Nakwi, according to you, what uh, would it take to improve the situation for women in Afghanistan? Should it be a painfully gradual process? Yes, I mean, you know, I don't think it is uh, wise or even realistic to expect immediate results. Uh, it will take time. It will take its own uh, course. And we, like, you know, we have a very curious situation, by the way. Pakistan has an embassy in Kabul. But Pakistan officially has not recognized the Taliban regime. So we are functioning. And uh, we, de facto, we, are, we have a, a recognition, I think, uh, in effect. But uh, we have not uh, formally uh, declared it. So, but Pakistan c uh, can't make a unilateral decision. Of course, it has to go with the international community's consent in that regard, isn't it? So that is what we are think the government thinks now. But uh, in 1994, when the first Taliban regime came, uh, Pakistan uh, took the lead. Uh, I know I was in the foreign office at that time. That uh, the uh, foreign office announced recognition of the, and I don't think that was wise. I think we must go along with the international community, at least the regional uh, countries. Only then can we have, uh, uh, can we can we justify any uh, uh, move towards recognition. Anyway, you asked the question. Uh, I deviated a little bit. You asked the question uh, as to w what uh, can be done. I think we should let things take its course. This. Uh, conference will perhaps make it clear that the western countries or most of the participants not all but most of the participants will uh, demand the uh, humanitarian aid to stop uh, because that is the 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 likelihood but i think it would not be wise they should leave some some opening uh, in this uh, any any position that they take. Do you really think that is going to be the scenario? Because the kind of Security Council resolution that we just go through it, uh, it calls, reaffirms its strong commitment to sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity. It also acknowledges the multifaceted challenges over there. Uh, now, uh, don't you think the international community, in a way, wants the United Nations to operate and continue its humanitarian operations over there? Yes, I think they they will keep some opening. Uh, whereby they can continue it, uh, but they will be very tough on uh, demanding uh, the Taliban to uh, accept women's rights of education and work. These are the two basic rights that uh, they want them to have. Right. Uh, Dr. Imam, uh, there was um, a little bit of difference of opinion regarding uh, this particular Security Council resolution. Uh, the uh, Russian ambassador over there uh, asked, urged the U.S. to unfreeze those assets it had frozen after the Taliban took over if it was sincere and serious towards the welfare of the people of Afghanistan. What role do you think the U.S. Uh, can play at this particular point in time? Because when uh, the Taliban took over, they froze the $7 billion in assets and afterwards half of which uh, was to be given to the Afghan people but not through the Afghan Taliban. Well, again, it could be a bait in times and uh, the amounts right now, you know, being seized and not being uh, given to the rightful uh, uh, people of Afghanistan, you know, there's a lot of politics involved in it. And again, it's going to be give and take. You have seen how the superpowers, you know, have been supporting the dicta dictatorial regimes, uh, the, the regimes, you know, which were not even following the some of the dem basic democratic values and principles. You, you don't know what is going to happen in time. 
so right now they believe that this amount can be used you know in times you know they might be using it to bait Afghanistan you know to give in to m many things in times you know uh, like I said you know when when the you, you uh, when the West was here just about a year ago the sec the situation in Afghanistan was, was was not so good you know the security situation that issues of terrorism the issue of a lot of uh, uh, robbery on highways and, and the issue of crime being taking place it has almost uh, settled down or come to an end after this unacceptable Taliban regime you know you have to give the devil as due you know in that way but the point is as far as US and the West is concerned all these concessions will come when it, there is going to be some agreement and like what the excellency has said you know it is very interesting you know like we have uh, our consulate there and, and we may we are not but lot of other countries you know our neighboring countries are also having wraps over there lot of corporates are also having uh, wraps over there it is it is also a news you know that lot of them are uh, exporting out from uh, uh, Afghanistan all that minerals and lithium and all that it's going on it's not that it has stopped you know uh, on the on the worst side would be the opium you know which is still coming from there and it's moving around to the other parts you know so business as usual in many places but as far as the regime is concerned they definitely are on the uh, on the side and uh, they have serious issues and uh, they have issues you know which doesn't commensurate with the international understanding and the international commitment right uh, when we talk about pakistan's perspective pakistan's uh, first and the foremost uh, demand from the afghan taliban had been over containing the band Tehrika Taliban Pakistan. We have seen a resurgence of terrorist activities here in Pakistan. Now, uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Ms. Hina Rabbani Khad, is there to share Pakistan's perspective. Now, Pakistan has always been desirous of a peaceful, stable, connected, and sovereign and prosperous uh, Afghanistan. So if that is a desire by the Pakistani authorities repeatedly uh, conveyed to the world community also, what sort of reciprocation is ideally expected of the Afghan Taliban uh, when it comes to the major demand by the uh, Pakistani authorities of containing that TTP? Well, if the ball is in their court, they are going to decide how they are going to hit back at you. The point is, there is an over-expectation. Afghanistan is a sovereign country. It has its own policies, strategies, and its own, own values and ways of life, you know. It's an over-expectation, you know. The, the theories of strategic depth. What is an over-expectation? Uh, the over-expectation that... To take that concrete or decisive action against the terrorist or militant outfits which have the safe havens on the Afghan soil? Well, you, you have to see the things from the Afghan perspective also. I am with you. You know, as a Pakistani, I would say, well, Afghans, we have been, uh, uh, we have been giving refuge to so many Afghan refugees and a lot of trade is taking place and uh, it's time that you understand we are different from others. That would be our perspective. But if you look from their perspective, they would say, well, things are not so much in our control as you believe they are in our control, they might say, one. Two, they might say that all this... Okay, the situation is improving uh, over there in Afghanistan. As you al uh, already mentioned, the corporate sector is coming and very uh, keen to be uh, investing over there. Uh, yet they don't have that very complete control in Afghanistan. So uh, there ha seems to be a contradiction in that argument. They, they have control to an extent. <coughs> but again, you know, what I'm saying, they don't have control over many of the groups which is working over there, like the TTP, you know. Or TTP has been their partner, you know, when they were, when they were fighting no, they for the freedom. Been an utter then you also talk about IS, IS, ISK, you know. <coughs> you talk about the other groups which are present over there. And even they are endangered by those uh, groups, you know. Even they have on many occasions, you know, and they are still trying to get hold of those people. They also have limitations of their intelligence, limitations of their kinetic actions, you know. You, you have to understand that also. But they had been taking decisive action against the IS Khurasan. Uh, where, where they could. They well, they could, but you have seen bomb blast. You have seen them uh, attacking their se senior leaderships. You have seen people killing over there. But having said that, I don't condone them. You know, we we have an expectation from them. You are our neighbor, and we have always been there, and we same ethnic affinity in that in in that context. So you need to reciprocate, like you just said. But they say, well, we have our own values, you know. But uh, it's not the matter of values. The, it's the matter of denial. The the Afghan uh, Taliban authorities have been denying that. Uh, that uh, the TTP is not present on the Afghan soil. Uh, rather, if they are taking action against IS Khurasan, that uh, 
shows that IS Khurasan is present on the Afghan soil. That's why they are taking action against them. But utterly denying the presence of TTB on an Afghan soil, how would they t uh, take the action against them? I, I don't think they did ever deny that TTP is not in Afghanistan. They never denied that. But, but there are a number of multiple they, they statements. Do, they do say that you need to negotiate with them on your own. This, these are some of the things that they say which we don't accept. They say, let's talk to them. Let's also listen to what they are saying which we believe that, well, they are saying something which is incoherent, illogical and irrational. Uh, they are trying to be extortionist. They are carrying well, out Pakistan attacks from uh, their... Pakistan has once before tried that, the negotiations, which emboldened them. No. And, and after which... Uh, no, we can talk about that negotiations. What sort of negotiation was that? But as far as TTA is concerned, TTP has always been part of TTA. They are one and the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. Remember this. Number one, with, as the war was being fought against US and the Western allies, TTP was siding with TTA. Now, when the war is over, they cannot, on, from their perspective, you know, they are not ready to actually say, okay, no more TTP. You know, battle, uh, this, uh, uh, what you call, uh, Gol Bahadur and all, they all live in Afghanistan. Everybody knows where they live. You know. And it's from there that they operate. And it's th from there, you know, they mo take all their moments, uh, uh, and all the activities which is taking place over there. We, ex we are expecting something from Afghanistan, but remember they are sovereign. And it's not our baby. We cannot be their mentor. We, we, need to t uh, we need to handle them like a sovereign state, and we need to use all informal channels from, from, the, uh, from the people of the bo uh, re regions you know, bordering Afghanistan. We need to use that uh, track two if you want, and we need to talk to people who are trading with them. We need to talk to people who are doing transportation with them. You know. And you can in involve all these informal channels to actually pressurize and bring them to uh, a certain level of negotiation. But they still feel that they have a pride and they are very uh, people with pride, uh, with history, you know. Mr. Nagui, according to you, what stops the Afghan Taliban to take that very concrete and decisive action specifically against the band that the Taliban Pakistan and Pakistan's demand? Well, you see, in the first place, they have not abided by their commitment because they had given a very clear commitment not just to Pakistan but also in Doha to the United States that their soil will not be used for attacks or aggression against other countries. And the TTP is lodged, is based in Afghan, on Afghan soil and they are attacking uh, uh, across the border uh, targets in Pakistan. So I think they, are, uh, they have not abided by their commitment. And Pakistan has a right to demand that they must abide by their commitment. And yes, I mean, the TTP has a point of view and they say we must negotiate, but there is no point in negotiating. They believe in violence. They don't believe in uh, discussions. Uh, they have a point of view uh, which is totally baseless and wrong. So what's the threat to uh, Tariq Taliban Afghanistan that they don't take a decisive action against but the as Taliban? As he Taliban said, Taliban. I, they are the same. I mean, there is no, not much of a difference between uh, TTA and TTP. Uh, um, uh, they are both after the same objectives and in, uh, unfortunately and fortunately in fact, uh, they, the TTP cannot uh, impose its will in Pakistan because it is a fringe organization. So uh, the, if they are the two sides of the same coin and they are uh, similar. So th there is a statement by the Afghan Foreign Ministry. Uh, Afghan Foreign Minister Amir Khan Mutaki is expected here in Pakistan. Now, uh, the Foreign Ministry of Afghanistan says the Afghan government wants to hold comprehensive bilateral talks on political uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan economic relations, regional stability, and transit. They are interested to have talks with the Pakistani authorities on all these uh, fronts except for the fact that they don't want to take a decisive action against the band Tariqa Taliban Pakistan. So they are expecting a lot from Pakistan and Pakistan is expecting them only to take action against the band Tariqa Taliban Pakistan. So is it much to expect from them? Well, we can, uh, you know, we can, we can offer a carrot because if they want all that from us, then they have to take action against the TTP. If we can compel or uh, force the Af uh, uh, Afghan Taliban regime uh, to uh, take action against TTP, not, not to uh, exist, I mean that they will continue to exist on Afghan soil, uh, whatever Afghanistan wants, but uh, that will happen. But they should not be undertaking terrorist attacks against Pakistan. 
we must insist on this and this is something that the taliban regime must impress or force the uh, uh, TTP. Do you think uh, Pakistan and China can collectively collaborate on this particular front in order to impress upon yeah. the Taliban to take uh, action against the militant outfits, yes, which yes. pose threat to Pakistan yes. and China as well? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, under the SCO framework also, the the the, the SCO framework, uh, uh, the SCO charter uh, calls for action, joint collective action against uh, terrorism, against human smuggling against drug uh, trafficking. Uh, so, the SCO charter originally began as that organization uh, for these purposes. So, um, uh, we can uh, also activate the SCO where China is a member. When you talk about China, I was reminded of SCO. Now, the, the you know, the, let me get back to one other old point that you uh, raised as to what the uh, Doha conference can do. The Doha conference can set up a committee or uh, a empower one particular nominated uh, s group of experts or uh, uh, officials uh, to uh, examine this problem of uh, uh, education for women and work uh, uh, opportunities for women uh, and to undertake negotiations with the uh, Taliban regime. Right, uh, Dr. Imam, your uh, take regarding this, uh, there is a lot of expectation when it comes to the Afghan authorities from Pakistani authorities. Now, they want to have trade relations, the economic relations with Pakistan, the political relations, regional stability they also talk about, and the transit also. So when specifically talk about regional stability, isn't it the first and the foremost prerequisite for the rest of the things to uh, be materialized between the two? You see, these are standard diplomatic jargons and expressions, you know that whenever they want to hold meeting, this is going to be a framework that they will move around and they will talk. You know. Coming back to the security issue, you know, like the excellencies have said, you know, they violated what they said. But then they also have an argument, if we have a devil advocacy, there were drones attack which was carried out over there and they believe that the U.S. violated their sanctity and again so they also if went the U.S. violates uh, the Doha peace agreement if you were talking about that so does it uh, mean that uh, the banned militant outfits would be allowed to uh, carry out terrorist activities against Pakistan? No, no. I'm so not saying is, that is at all. Pakistan has uh, to bear I'm the brunt of the wrongdoing uh, of or any violation of the U.S.? I'm just rephrasing. I'm, I'm just trying to build an argument over here. There was, there was an agreement that they were supposed to follow and they violated it. There is no denial but in that. But there are multiple reports but that then they have reasons the US to say why they and have done the Taliban that. had and been collaborating to agree. carry out attacks against and have operations against IS Khurasan collectively also. Yes. Now, coming to the other part, you know, the regional st uh, stability part, you know, we have armed forces of Pakistan which is very capable, which has done a wonderful job. N the new, new thing which has happened is they have given lead to the police and civil administration. Now, in the National Security Committee, it was also decided that it's police and a civil administration which is going to take a lead. I think they need to build their capacity, give them the resources, give them that motivation, and the armed forces should always be there, you know, like they've done in the past, you know. So, moving the civil people forward, and meanwhile talking with the Afghanistan government that this is not to be tolerated, me, uh, and just we, we go after those people who are militants, we go after those people who are doing extortions and we go after those people who are criminals. That is our part, you know, and we should do it through civil administration, through the due process, number one. And number two, we keep on talking to them, you see. N even they, you know, they come up with different answers or different expressions. Do you, do you expect anything substantial happening uh, if the foreign minister of Afghanistan comes over here and have the meeting with the Pakistani authorities? Anything substantial? I think it's going expected? to make a difference. And I think the more negotiation we had, I was told this is the sixth meeting that they are going to have. You know, the uh, they, they have been. Uh, he is the a trilateral a summit, uh, Pakistan, tri China. Yeah, and and the, this is the sixth meeting, and I also believe that there were early meetings also, you know, which was held. They are coming, they, you know, the best way to move forward is negotiation. The best way to move forward is talk to each other. The best way is that you understand each other. And of course, you know, you need to be very reasonable and convincing and trying to convert people who are not ready to accept the standard norms of life. Right, Mr. Nagvi, your quick last comment regarding how to talk to the Afghan foreign minister when he comes here in Pakistan regarding Pakistan's demand of uh, taking a concrete action, uh, especially regarding uh, banned TTP. Yeah, well, since that is our principal concern, we should uh, uh, make that demand uh, with the Afghan foreign minister. And 
we should at the same time offer uh, the other facilities that they uh, are looking for. Uh, it is a give and take and uh, I think uh, we have to impress upon the Afghan Taliban that they should demand or uh, require the TTP, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, not to uh, uh, launch attacks against Pakistan, uh, Pakistani targets from across the border. Now, Pakistan has also invited the Afghan authorities to become the part of CPAC also. There is a similar sort of invitation by the Chinese officials to the Afghan authorities. So don't you think they see that uh, those dividends associated with the CPAC, BRI and the regional connectivity? Yes, yes. They, they, they would so what be, else can Pakistan uh, offer in return for this trade, trade demand to be met? Uh, trade and uh, also, uh, you know, humanitarian assistance to the extent that we can provide. and. Uh, education facilities to Afghans. We, you know, we have often ignored this particular area. The, uh, the Afghans go to the Indians. Why do they go to the Indians? They should come to Pakistani universities. They should come to Pakistani uh, medical colleges and uh, engineering colleges. So, we should offer that. We should offer different, uh, uh, you know, social, uh, civil society interaction. Right. Thank you very much for being with us on the show, Mr. Ali Sarwar Nakvi, former ambassador. Really appreciate your time. We were uh, also honored to have been joined in the studio by Dr. Sayed Kalim Imam, expert in international relations. Thank you very much for your time. Also for being with us on News on News tonight. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.